The Unshackled Waves, Episode 79. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode and I am joined uh, once again for his second time on the show, Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts. Welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be uh, on the podcast again, Tim, and uh, less exciting week this week but still some uh, great news to delve into. Oh, I don't think great's the, the, the right word because there, it seems to be that there's uh, a lot of our society that's uh, under attack, like uh, Australia Day, for example, continues to be uh, under siege from uh, inner city councils in Melbourne. Two councils so far have decided to cancel their annual Australia Day festivities and more are now wanting to follow. And now there's also uh, statues and parks. Uh, there's demands for them to be uh, renamed uh, uh, from colonial Australians. The same-sex marriage debate continues. This week it was the advocates of same-sex marriage who seemed to be triggered by everything. They, they took offence at traditional marriage posters that were up in Melbourne and Brisbane. And even though that they're, they're quite co- uh, confident of, of winning, they, uh, they st- still seem to be going in a frenzy to get people uh, enrolled to, to vote. And it seems that all the positive media coverage over the years is, is not enough for them. Uh, over in America, Steve Bannon left the White House as chief strategist. He's now bracket uh, Breitbart and he's saying that the Trump presidency is over and that he's going to war for Trump. Uh, With new personnel at the White House, it's unsure of the direction that Trump will now take. And also the uh, Canadian alt media outlet uh, Rebel Media, which is actually home of uh, Mark Latham's Outsiders in Australia, has had uh, a horror past week uh, post uh, their Charlottesville rally coverage. Uh, Several employees have quit or been fired. And there's also allegations of it misappropriate crowdfunding money. So in inner Melbourne, it's been uh, Yarra City Council last week and now Darwin uh, Council have voted to, to dump Australia Day. The, the federal government's response has been to strip the abilities of these councils to hold citizenship ceremonies, which is a, a real lip wrist response. Uh, another council, uh, Moreland... Uh, inner city council came within uh, one vote and now uh, another council in Melbourne, this time in suburban Melbourne, uh, Banyol Council has announced that they're having a review uh, into their Australia Day celebrations and despite the fact that 85% of Australians support Australia Day, these councils, it seems to be getting, it seems to be catching on. I mean, you know, what more councils are going to follow? Well, I, I think that it obviously isn't a true reflection of middle Australia or, or any normal Australians. You say that 85% uh, support keeping Australia Day on Australia Day uh, when Captain Cook discovered this great land. Uh, but there's obviously, uh, an, there's obviously an influx of Greens uh, members into these council groups and uh, with their Marxist ideology, they want to wipe clear uh, all of our proud history. Um, pretty much, I think, uh, for uh, because they believe in this concept of white guilt, that the white man is uh, is essentially you can blame him on every single failure. Um, and I think this whole white guilt uh, phenomenon is. Is, infiltra- is in these uh, far left inner city councils, and I think that's why uh, we are having uh, this push to change Australia Day, uh, which is just awful. Oh, well, you can't actually say that uh, 
Captain Cook discovered Australia because, of course, Stan Grant has said that the the Captain Cook statue in Sydney, he wants the uh, engravery uh, taken off that says he discovered Australia because it's insulting to Indigenous civilization. So that's even another front that uh, this attack on Australia Day is taking. They're, they're now attacking, you know, our statues and the, our cl uh, colonial leaders. Well, no one says, um, no, we acknowledge, Andrew Bolt said this perfectly, we acknowledge that it was Indigenous people in Australia, uh, but, we, but we say Captain Cook discovered Australia because he was the first man to circumnavigate, I believe, the Southern Hemisphere, discovered Australia and New Zealand and, and whatnot. That's, uh, that, that's what they mean by discovered Australia. It's, it's not to say that there weren't Indigenous people before then. It's like when people say that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Yes, there were, there were Indians there, but he was the first Westerner to discover America. Likewise with Marco Polo in China. No one's disputing the fact that there weren't any Chinese there, but they're just saying that he was the first, uh, I guess, Westerner to discover these uh, lands in the Far East and in, in the Deep South. So... The, the way that... I think it's uh, definitely literal, literalism from the far left um, and they're just trying to undermine our values and institutions. Uh, I definitely think, I mean, Australia Day, in, in my opinion, uh, is the founding of modern Australia. Like, of course, nobody denies that there was an indigenous civilization before that, but the modern Australia, with all the uh, pro prosperity and freedoms we enjoy today, what it did start on uh, January 26, 1788. And I, I think that it's... Um, that colonialism gets a bad rap, and I might get myself in trouble for saying this, but the standard of living in countries where the Brits have been, for instance, India, if you look at the life expectancy, since it's how it's gone up since colonial times, you look at Africa, South Africa, for instance, lifespans have doubled and tripled in some instances. There's hospitals, infrastructure, people can have a good standard of living. And um, the blame colonialism on the plight of, uh, well, ethnic minorities to begin with is a bit silly um, because colonialism, although it has uh, had its abuses, uh, for instance, uh, uh, well, the stolen generation, uh, it, it has uh, to a large part been beneficial for many uh, of these developing countries around the globe. And certainly did, uh, you know, colonial Australians, did they do some bad things? Uh, of course, you know, nobody, no historical figure is without it f it's, uh, their flaws, but overall they had a net positive contribution to modern Australia and, you know, basically, and you mentioned Andrew Bolt before, he said that we're going to have, at this rate, we're going to have to basically uh, disavow every uh, Prime Minister up until the White Australia policy was abolished. And, and also the other point that, that uh, Andrew made that was uh, quite valuable is that the poisoning of waterholes uh, and the smallpox blankets was just a, a, well, it's a myth made up by an Australian poet, and it has absolutely no historical groundings. And Bill Shaw was found that in Parliament, and uh, he should know better, quite frankly. Uh, that was the first time I'd heard of those stories, and you know, if if they are uh, being spread around, I mean, that's really malicious lies that you know isn't isn't contributing anything towards, you know, reconciliation or, you know, peaceful community cohesion? What it is contributing, though, is to is division, um, complete division. We need unity. We don't need division and we don't need this information being spread by the leader of the opposition. And that's why some uh, Indigenous uh, leaders have actually come out against these uh, inner city uh, councils in in Melbourne at the moment uh, because they they don't actually have uh, 
many local Indigenous people, the, the ones that do live there are, are middle class. There's an excellent Alice Springs councillor, Jacinta Price, who said that, you know, this uh, changing of Australia Day it does nothing to, you know, help, uh, you know, the problems that are going on in Indigenous communities with, um, you know, d uh, domestic violence, uh, for example. She said we need to stop with this virtue signalling and, you know, look at actual solutions. Well, these symbolic gestures, as you said, don't change the rates of alcoholism, domestic violence, and incarceration in Indigenous communities. It's just posturing, gesturing, and virtue signalling. Uh, and if we if we are to get uh, reconciliation with our Indigenous people, uh, certainly changing the names or taking down monuments or changing Australia Day isn't the way to get there. Uh, and certainly they're taking a leaf out of what's going on in the United States at the moment with the taking down of all those uh, Confederate monuments because the, the left, they, they are being successful at getting these monuments taken down. And so uh, it's often said what happens in America comes here. And uh, long behold, the, the left are trying to do the same thing to Australia's history. Well, it, it's, a plague, it's a plague of craziness. That's, that's what I'm calling it. Uh, these people in, in America, um, uh, I've, I described them in my article on the, uh, the ACL bombing as pretty much the modern day equivalent to the red shirts. Uh, they've got a far left Marxist agenda and they want to rewrite history in a way that suits their ideology and their cause. And uh, they, they don't really care about anything uh, but excelling their ideological Marxist cause. Oh, well, the, the positive thing is, is as I mentioned, 85% of Australians, based on a recent poll, support Australia Day. So it's the Australian people just need to, to make their voices heard that, you know, we don't want this. And it was interesting, Seven News in their vox pop on the street, like of all the people they asked were saying, this is, you know, ridiculous. What are they, what are they on about? We just need to, you know, get, get through to... You know, to have some sort of reform of these councils so this type of behaviour can't go on. And I, I believe that Malcolm Turnbull revoked licences to issue Australian Day citizenship um, ceremonies at these councils, which is a good first step. Uh, we need to take a stand. But what I believe is that public opinion can change quite quickly because these these far lefties have got a lot of influence in the Australian uh, Education Union and uh, they can uh, indoctrinate uh, children with propaganda. I, I for, for instance, have been indoctrinated with uh, let's change Australia Day policy, let's uh, create another flag that doesn't have the Union Jack on there because it's a symbol of oppression. So this, this indoctrination is happening in schools and before you know it, public opinion will change, much like it happened with same-sex marriage just because of the indoctrination, propaganda, and um, constant uh, advertising and pressure by groups such as Get Up. Uh, I probably disagree with that. I mean, young people might be progressive on other social issues, but definitely when it comes to Australia Day and uh, you know, pride in the nation, they are still very firm supporters of that. Well, well we can only um, hope for that him because if we start to lose um, pride in what makes us great, what makes us Australian, uh, then we will be going downhill quite quickly. Uh, if, we, if we get divided by race, if we accept the doctrine of intersectionality and dividing everyone by race and class and religion, except the, in, instead of accepting everyone as Australians, uh, then, then I do see Australia Day may be changed in the future, come 20, 30 years' time, when this doctrine of intersectionality and this Marxist doctrine takes hold of our institutions. I can see it changing. So we really need to make sure that what our youth are being taught is liberal, pro-democratic and pro-Australian and, and definitely none of this Marxist hoo-ha. Now, last week on this show, I said that both sides of the, the same-sex marriage debate were becoming a bit too triggered. Well, I've definitely changed my mind this week, and it's definitely the, the left and the LGBT activists who uh, uh, appear to be getting 
triggered all the time just by people having opposing viewpoints. And of course, the, the obvious example was their reaction to the traditional marriage posters that were distributed in Melbourne and Brisbane earlier this week. The uh, Australian traditionalist nationalist group were responsible for the ones in, in Brisbane. They had two sets of po posters. One was uh, d uh, protect the traditional family and the other one was it was a take on the, the ill-fated Dutch Airlines uh, pr uh, pride poster which said it doesn't matter who you click with with uh, uh, belt buckles and of course people pointed out that uh, you know you need different buckles to uh, click together and so the the uh, these posters said obviously only one of them clicks but it was the probably the ones in Melbourne that uh, got the the most attention which uh, had the headline stop the fags we don't we can't well the unshackled can't confirm who is behind those posters we have been told by um, people in the Australian nationalist movement that it's this group called uh, Antipodin Resistance, but they're very elusive. And on those posters, it's not only said that, it also had a, a list of statistics about the abuse uh, of children in same-sex uh, households. So the, the left have been crying, um, you know, hate speech all week. I, I think the the ones put up in Brisbane, I think they were perfectly reasonable. Probably the ones in Melbourne uh, uh, overstepped the, the mark. But, you know, we do live in a democracy, as Malcolm Turnbull pointed out, we do have uh, free speech. I mean, if you don't like these posters, just, re you know, respond to their arguments. We don't live in a theocracy or a totalitarian dictatorship where we don't have, um, you know, free speech or where, where our thoughts aren't controlled by legislation, well, to a large degree. I think that these posters um, uh, need to stay true to the message. Um, I'm, def I'm on the no side, but I, I can see that these posters can be very dangerous in changing public opinion the wrong way. So I urge everyone on the no campaign to keep it reasonable and keep it civil. But I think that the real culprits here are the LGBTQI, uh, whatever they call themselves, um, because they can't handle freedom of speech um, or debating ideas. Now, I think the, the biggest uh, uh, place where you can see this happen, or probably the most prominent, should I say, is uh, uh, Peter Van Oslo did an interview with Lyle Shelton, uh, of the Australian Christian Lobby, and he did uh, an interview uh, as well. You know, both men were sitting on the couch, uh, the marriage equality fellow, and you could see that Lyle had the facts and the figures, you know, embedded into his brain. And um, the marriage equality fellow, he, he got triggered, he got upset, he kept running away from the questions. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay objective here, but. I think that you can definitely see that one side uh, is being more factual, more reasoned, and one side's definitely being more emotive in this debate. Uh, I, uh, I hardly think that uh, Peter Van Onslen is a, a good moderator. I mean, he's uh, been, you know, quite, uh, quite hysterical himself, saying that, you know, with this plebiscite, LGBT people are going to be, like, abused and bashed in the street, like, really over-the-top over the language. Well, I think um, Van Olsen describes himself as a moderate, but I really think that his job as a journalist should be to moderate between the sides and not impart his opinion. If you want to watch opinion journalism, for God's sake, uh, watch uh, that Madden girl on um, uh, NSNBC or watch Andrew Bolt. You know, if you want, he's, he's, he's should be a serious journalist. But instead, he's an opinion journalist uh, dressed up as a serious one. I think this is a real issue. And it's also been revealed that uh, uh, various local councils, uh, again, another problem with <laughs> local government, and also the ABC are offering counselling services to their LGBT employees for the duration of the plebiscite, which is, 
Uh, it's, well, it's, so they're basically, and this is uh, an argument that David Linehouse put forward as well, that basically you're saying that this group of people who supposedly have come, uh, have come through all this oppression are, are so, you know, weak and fragile that they, they can't handle, you know, a, a debate which is, you know, si uh, simply about should, you know, marriage be uh, applied to same-sex relationships. Uh, Lion Helm, uh, I've met David, he's a very, and I think you have as well, Tim, uh, he's a very, very level-headed and reasonable man. Uh, he's a very principled libertarian. Um, I agree with him completely on economics. I'm a, a pure Austrian e economist. Uh, my, that's my beliefs, the Austrian school. Uh, but I don't agree with him on social policy here. I have to disagree with him. But his, his comment uh, that you refer to, that uh, that same-sex uh, people uh, can't cope with the rigour of such a debate is in itself uh, homophobic and, and it, it really just goes to show uh, the labour left's doctrine of intersectionality, breaking people up into kind of brackets and how destructive it is. But I, I'm, I'm sure uh, I've, I've spoken with a, a few LGBT uh, people about this and they all seem to be reasonable uh, about this debate. So I think that this idea that it's causing LGBT people harm uh, is blown up and it's completely out of proportion. Um, and it's just a tactic that the radical left are using to uh, suppress free speech. And of course, there was also the story that Australia uh, post workers uh, won't have to deliver uh, mail regarding the plebiscite that they f uh, find offensive, which is. Uh, I, I mean, they have, a lot of them want to force, you know, Christian bakers to bake a cake, but they don't want to have to deliver the mail. Hypocrisy is rampant. It's ridiculous. Um, I, I, just, I just can't take any more hypocrisy. I think I'm going to have a hypocrisy overdose with, these, uh, with this crowd. Um, the, the job of a post is to deliver posts. If my post didn't deliver me, um, say, let's, let's say, let's, Say I was a member of the Lib Dems or the Australian Conservatives and he was a green lefty and he chose not to deliver my mail. Where does it end? Seriously. The job of a post is to deliver mail and not to ask questions. Yeah, it's always been treated as a pretty serious offence to tamper with the mail. Yeah, well, I, it's actually a criminal offence. And uh, there's a heavy pie, uh, fine and uh, maybe there's even imprisonment because these are confidential documents. Um, and if you're sifting through people's mail to see if you don't like it or not, well, that's, that's uh, unacceptable. And of course, like they've, uh, we've talked about these posters, and, and it seems to be that uh, the, all the um, progressive uh, media outlets giving them years of positive coverage, it seems to be uh, not enough for them because they've held uh, a last-minute enrolment drive. Uh, probably by the time this uh, podcast is uh, released, the uh, in uh, the chance to update your enrolment details or register to vote in the plebiscite, uh, the deadline will have passed. So uh, on Wednesday night, a group of progressive media websites they blacked out their websites and they uh, they just had instead of their advertising just had directions how to vote yes in the plebiscite directions to the AC website and today I did a, a live video uh, MTV Australia across their three networks on Foxtel from 6 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m. they just ran like 12 hours of uh, marriage equality propaganda Uh, Tim, uh, can you book me a plane ticket to North Korea? I don't think the propaganda will be any worse there, honestly. Where have we got to? Uh, a lot of people were saying to me when I uh, was streaming uh, what was uh, being put on MTV, they're like, that actually looks like, you know, they're doing hypnosis on us because it was really like a bizarre gra <laughs> rainbow graphic and they're like, whoa, this is, what are they trying to do? Have you seen the episode of The Simpsons where they uh, they get a bunch of Hawaiian dancers and they play uh, a Join the Navy song backwards uh, to kind of hypnotise people into joining the Navy? You know, it's uh, quite similar. 
And, and all this, like, la uh, this last-minute drive to, you know, get young people enrolled, to, to vote yes, uh, that's the only reason they, they want them enrolled, uh, it's, it smacks quite a bit of desperation, despite the fact they've said all throughout they're, they're confident uh, of victory, yet they're, you know, scrambling, really. Well, I think it, it, well, it shows uh, a fabrication, possibly, of the amount of support that they have. Now, Stephen Crowder uh, on, on his uh, YouTube account did a very, very interesting uh, look at this um, on how they have thousands of people interested in events. They get them to congregate at a place where there's already a couple hundred people there, and they claim it is their rally. Um, and with, with their filming tactics, he also talked about that, how they always have the camera out, and, and so you can manipulate how many people actually have supporting them. And I think that that's a tactic that they're using to actually get it across the line, saying that everyone supports it uh, and you hate homosexuals if you're against it, which is just ludicrous. So over in the United States, uh, President Trump has had another shakeup of his administration. Probably the, the biggest name to leave is uh, Steve Bannon as uh, chief strategist. Uh, this perhaps is maybe a coincidence that it was post the Charlottesville rally. Uh, Bannon has immediately rejoined Breitbart. He said that uh, the Trump presidency, as we know it, is over and that he's uh, going to, to war for Trump. And uh, a lot of people are now saying that the establishment is, is back in charge in, in Washington. They, they point out that Trump is now surrounded by ex-military generals, like, for example, his chief of staff, uh, John Kelly, and he's committed to uh, continuing the war uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, well, is this a bad thing? Uh... Well, George Bush said, I've had a change of heart um, on this. I, I, for one, was a big fan of the Rand Paul uh, look at this of foreign policy, but I had um, been influenced by Mr. Shapiro to join the dark side, the neoconservatives, um, on, on foreign policy. That's about all that I agree with neocons on, I think, now. I think that if we have uh, some kind of force in Afghanistan, that uh, actively advises uh, military in Afghanistan uh, to take out terrorists. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. The problem I do have with is, say, spending $20 million or $50 million on building university in Kabul or building hospitals or schools. I don't think we should be doing that. I think our focus should be on killing terrorists, as Trump said. And I think that if we have a force, a permanent force in Afghanistan that is dedicated to um, killing terror cells where they begin. Uh, I don't have a problem with this, but it is definitely a foreign policy shift in the Trump administration to more of a, a neoconservative conservative view on things. Uh, is it uh, for the worst, though, is the question. We can see what happened with America when they had a hands-off policy uh, that was heavily influenced by Russians that infiltrated progressive groups in America uh, to uh, influence the public to have an isolation of view. That, that allowed the USSR and uh, Nazi Germany to expand. And I think that this isolation of view can be quite dangerous because it just if you're leaving terrorists alone, it's not good. We, we definitely um, need to be killing them where they are so they don't come over here. And we also need to be cutting immigration in half uh, as well. So, uh, so we only take in skilled migrants uh, from areas of the world where we don't have terrorism problems, and then I think that we won't have terrorism issues like uh, there is in Europe if we just focus on skilled migrants who can contribute to the economy that aren't from terrorist-prone areas in the world. Uh, yeah, I have to uh, uh, disagree. I mean, uh, f uh, in my opinion, I mean, the, the Afghanistan war has been going since 2001. Uh, in my opinion, US foreign policy has always just made uh, a situation worse. I mean, the, the Middle East, I mean, I'm not saying it, it were, used to be in a, in a good way, but every intervention is, has just made it worse. I mean, 
uh, Al Qaeda was supposedly the worst organization in the in the world, but thanks to uh, U.S. foreign policy, we now have an even worse organization in ISIS. Well, yes, uh, I hate to say you've got me in a bit of a checkmate position here, uh, Tim. I think that the war in Iraq is a different situation to the war in Afghanistan, though. Leaving dictators like Gaddafi uh, was good. Leaving dictators like Saddam Hussein probably was good uh, because they had to focus on killing terrorists. But we had to, I think we had to go into Afghanistan because they harbored Saddam Hussein, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Osama bin Laden, the man who orchestrated 9-11 um, and uh, housed him, essentially. It gave him a safe haven um, to create al-Qaeda camps uh, within Afghanistan. And, and to keep us safe at home, um, this is probably going to be a very, very unpopular position uh, with a libertarian uh, side like this. But I think that we need to be there, killing terrorists and breaking up terror cells uh, at home and abroad. Well, probably Afghanistan is the least, uh, or has been the least controversial uh, U.S. intervention, basically because of what uh, did happen uh, on 9/11. But let's uh, focus on uh, Trump domestically now. Uh, now, what was really disturbed me was there was a a free speech rally in Boston over the weekend, which was made up of conservatives and libertarians. There was, you know, no alt-right or white nationalists in sight. Uh, but, of course, the left and Antifa showed up to you know, sh uh, shut it down and called them Nazis. And Trump on Twitter praised the leftist protesters, which was just bizarre. And is that a sign of a change of direction? Well, I think that Trump was definitely in the wrong here. Uh, I've heard about this protest being organised for a long time uh, from uh, Gavin McInnes and, and whatnot talking about this rally um, and, and whatnot. It's certainly made out of groups of individuals uh, who aren't alt-right or neo-Nazis. They're just uh, libertarian patriots, uh, Tea Party people, um, and there's certainly nothing to worry about. Um, I think that Trump may, and, and certainly is, consumed by what CNN says about him uh, you know, and this is this is where a lot of right-wing politicians or simply what I call um, people with common sense uh, get it wrong this, this is where they lose a bit of their common sense is the media establishment is left at center and they're never going to be your friends and appeasing them is terrible and, and Winston Churchill said this about appeasement uh, a man who uh, is an appeaser is one who feeds the crocodile hoping it will eat him last and I think that selling out your own is, is terrible, and I have to completely disagree with the President on this issue. I think probably the more disturbing thing to, to come out of Charlottesville, which uh, was the, I mean, that's the only right-wing rally that has you know, got out of control, is that now basically the, the mainstream media and establishment politicians, they're going to say that everyone to the right of, say, like Mitt Romney is going, is going to be labelled an extremist, a Nazi, you, na you name it. Well, Mitt Romney, uh, I have to say, he was probably one of the most respectful politicians that has ever existed, well, most respectful man, uh, most decent man that probably ever ran for the Oval Office uh, for a long time. And they, they, the mainstream media over there, uh, when I say the mainstream media, everyone else but Fox, really. I view Fox as a bit of a renegade outfit. Uh, but they, they depicted Mitt, Mitt as some kind of uh, sociopathic uh, man who uh, tied his animals up to roofs and uh, tortured things. And they just made Mitt, If they make Mitt Romney sound evil, I'm sure that, uh, that if uh, that they, they, 2,000 years ago they could have made Jesus Christ sound awful. Uh, they, they really do have a vendetta uh, towards any one right of centre. And you have to look at where the funding comes from for these uh, outfits. And, uh, and uh, a lot of it runs back to Soros, especially with MSNBC. Uh, but Trump returned to form at a, a rally that he held for his supporters in Phoenix, where he 
you know, lashed out at, you know, his treatment by, you know, mainstream media, you know, defended, you know, his, his record uh, to date. And, uh, of course, the, the mainstream media, you know, didn't like that because they're like, oh, he's, you know, go, going off a script, which I think is actually, like, I want, want him to, you know, be more like that because I feel that there's, two, like, that's probably why he made the, the Boston tweet because there's heaps of people now in the White House, you know, saying you've got to, you know, tone it down and that. But it was good to see that, you know, the, the old Trump, the, the Trump that people voted for is still there. I think that in a sense, it's just enticing people. It's just keeping the base happy uh, with those rallies. And then uh, it's a bit like the puppets here, you know, everyone's looking at the puppet uh, and the real action's happening here. And I think that the rallies are just the way to distract all his base from the neoconservative direction that he's taken, the big government, George Bush approach. I, I'm certainly small government I, I uh, with everything uh, and uh, pretty pretty libertarian uh, and, and conservative with some elements of my thinking. I agree with the foreign policy, but I think that if we go down to uh, keep funding things like Planned Parenthood, uh, and Obamacare, um, uh, the, com uh, the U.S. will just uh, keep keep uh, getting more and more debt, uh, and eventually this, this bubble will burst. Uh, I also don't like how he's uh, taken ownership of this huge stock market bubble that uh, Obama's created and branding it as his own. I think that's going to be disastrous, and it'll probably cost him a second term. Uh, but overall, I'm giving him about a B. I'm reasonably happy with what he's doing. And uh, it's certainly better than uh, uh, a continuation of the Clinton dynasty. Uh, I think the, the, the main thing that Trump has to do uh, from now on is to make sure that the wall starts to get built. I mean, that is what he, um, he promised, and still the, the groundwork hasn't, hasn't even been laid yet. If the wall doesn't get built, if the stock market crashes, um, or if there's, uh, that will be the end of Trump. He, he, if the stock market crashes and the walls build, I'm sure he can get a second term. One of those two things have to happen. The economy needs to stay relatively steady. It's not going great at the moment, but the economy needs to stay relatively steady. Uh, the bubble, if the bubble doesn't pop, uh, he'll be fine. But interest rates are very, very low over there indeed. And, uh, it's just not encouraging sensible financial practices if you've got interest rates. I think they're about 1% over there. Um, and uh, you might see a, a repeat of, of 2008. But he, he really he really needs to uh, focus on, on small government, although I don't think it will happen. I just think that he's marginally better than Clinton at the moment. But, uh, yeah. Now, a story that was of interest to us since we are in the alternative uh, media field was uh, what's happened at uh, Rebel Media, the Canadian uh, alt media outlet over the past week. They copped a lot of backlash for their former reporter, Faith Goldie, covering the Charlottesville uh, rally. Many of its uh, part-time staff uh, quit. They've been blacklisted by a lot of uh, Canada's conservative politicians, which is their, their main conservative party or the, the people who you know, used to give them support. And they also, yeah, they initially uh, backed up Faith Goldie, but when they found out that she uh, did an appearance on uh, a podcast for the Daily Stormer, which is a neo-Nazi white supremacist website, uh, that's when Ezra Levent, the rebel commander, made the decision to, to let her go. And so it's, uh, a lot of people have... Uh, uh, been saying that, oh, is this the end for, you know, the rebel, you know, have they, like, ruined their their reputation? Well, I, I certainly do think that they have. Um, uh, Palin uh, Roberts, uh, Robertson uh, certainly put together a very um, damning video, shall I say, of, of rebel. And uh, he had a montage of uh, please sign our petition, please sign our petition. And then he stated, without a great degree of uh, evidence, shall I say, that uh, Rebel was misappropriating funds, shoving it in their own pockets, what have you. Um, 
that is concerning, for sure. But I, I think that, uh, that the rebel media will survive, but it won't be the, the force that it once was. Um, it's, they've recently lost their co-founder, uh, Brian Lilly, over this, or over the editorial direction, um, and losing uh, people like Faith Goldie, uh, you know, absolutely stunning, gorgeous, incredibly switched on, you know, probably one of the best things uh, to happen to Rebel alongside Lauren Southern, uh, who was also lost, um, uh, went, went, uh, went, uh, went, went away uh, from Rebel. Uh, because of the Israeli trip, I understand, and she wasn't happy with when when Rebel asked for more money when they already had the funds required for the well, Israeli trip. Well, that's the trip. allegation so, that Kaylin Robertson made. Uh, um, but yeah, we don't we don't know if, if that's hundred percent true. Well, you uh, you, you have to be very sceptical uh, about these things. I, I am I, I'm shocked by those allegations, but it wasn't. Too much weight behind them. The, the video itself was damning and shocking, uh, but it was also uh, not very well weighted down with evidence, and it was malicious, and it was self-serving, and it was designed um, to destroy Rebel's image. I, I view Kayla Robinson as a complete narcissist, the complete self-serving idiot um, who is destroying the alt media scene through his. Um, his antics here, and I think he should have a bloody good hard look at himself for what he's done. Uh, in Kalen's, uh, you know, the the truth about Rebel Media video, he he played snippets of like he secretly recorded as well event when uh, he was in, in the UK trying to negotiate a, a severance payment. And Ezra talks about you know hush money, which it sounds all very damaging. Now under pressure, Kalen released the the full recording, which appears to you know back up you know Ezra's story, uh, which he put in his uh, blackmail video that uh, Kalen Robertson and his partner were, were they kept making demands for, you know, emergency funds and they, they, they kept uh, misappropriating them. And the full recording seems to, seems to back up what Ezra is saying, because there's, there's never any mention of any, any sort of, you know, keep quiet about what the rebel's doing here or anything. It, it appears that, you know, Kalen's the one who's trying to uh, extort money. And yeah, I have been uh, following this story closely and Ezra Levent, he uh, recently released, normally his TV show is behind the rebel paywall, but his uh, recent show where he reflected on the, the past week, um, he released that uh, to the public on, on YouTube and he, he showed us a clip of uh, Kaylin Robertson, his appearance on a UK reality TV show uh, which uh, talked about uh, young people in debt and uh, Kaylin was on, was on it, uh, he, he was in £5,000 worth of debt because he had spent that money trying to be famous on the internet. Uh, what, what he'd basically done is he, he, he borrowed all, all this money and with a bunch of people had gone to you know, five-star hotels and partied with them, filmed it all and uploaded it online in an effort to get famous. And basically, because uh, 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 it has, uh, this is like pu uh, publicly available reality TV, it basically paints Kaylin as, you know, just this uh, attention seeker who wants to get famous. And clearly he saw the, the rebel media as an opportunity for him to to get attention and Ezra admitted this himself that you know he he did show poor judgment in basically you know hiring this guy which if he did like a bit of background on him you know would have known that you know he's he's not the type of person that can be trusted well um thank you for filling me in on that thing I wasn't aware of that Israel event video uh, I had seen it, but I hadn't watched it. So basically, from, from what I get here, is that he's uh, cherry picked a few lines and probably probably in an effort to extort even more money from Ezra. Um, to risk quoting George Bush, uh, I uh, looked into Ezra's eyes and I you know I saw he was a was a good man and and, and of good spirits and. Uh, I've, I've met Ezra. He's um, yeah, we uh, both met him at the not, Friedman conference. Yeah. 
Yeah, and he, he's, he's certainly a, a hero of the alternative media, uh, certainly a man with a lot of drive, a lot of ambition, and, and a lot of vision. He's a great entrepreneur. We should venerate entrepreneurs. We shouldn't put them down. Um, and I think that Ezra uh, showed a bit of poor judgment. He, he, he told me at the Friedman conference to send him an email with a box box three-minute video, and I'll see how you go. I've never got around to that, but that was just, he, he, that was pretty much, you know, I could have got a job out of a, out of a half an hour chat with Ezra. Um, so that, that does show that his uh, practices of uh, employing people, uh, his due diligence isn't uh, up to scratch uh, for sure. Uh, I also pointed Ezra in the direction of Mark Latham, which hopefully a few of uh, the people watching this podcast are happy with. I sat down with him, had a chat, and I said, I think Mark's a man. So I think that Ezra is great. Uh, he's, he's great for, as you would say, unshackling uh, the Australian populace from the, uh, the agenda-driven mainstream media. But I think that the practices of rebel, I think it's a good lesson that they need to be a bit more stringent when they employ people. They've obviously had good luck with Claire Lehman uh, and uh, Mr. Ahmed and uh, Mark Latham, but it just goes to show a lot like uh, with immigration policy that you have to be careful because uh, the, the, the wolf can sneak through with the um, pack of sheep. Yeah, I mean, in Australia, like you mentioned, the people they've hired, they're all, you know, well-established uh, people. He's, he's really put together a, uh, a solid team uh, in Australia. But yes, it, it's, and he conceded this, um, I, I will link to this uh, video in the show notes page because Ezra, he's, He's he's very uh, open and forthright and says, you know, we do need to do things a bit differently. And he, he did uh, uh, release uh, Rebels accounts, uh, you know, showing where where all the all the money goes because they they don't just do premium memberships; they also do crowdfunding for their for their trips and that. And so he, you know, conceded that yeah, like I do want to be transparent with you. And it was actually like. There, there was nothing scandalous about you know what what was in the accounts. He's he's got a link which is uh, uh, the rebel dot media slash trust where you can look at it uh, for yourself. And I remember w watching the show and it's like, oh, this financial stuff. It's all really boring. It's like, <laughs> like it, it's not the scandal that we all promised. Uh, it's certainly hyped up for uh, Cohen's mm. own amusement. I think Tim. Yeah, and so I, I definitely think, and obviously losing Faith Goldie is 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 quite a loss as well. I did listen to that uh, podcast. She appeared on the the Daily Stormer, and you can understand why Ezra, you know, to, uh, made that decision to fire her because she really seems to sympathise with these you know, alt-right people saying, you know, people should, you know, take you seriously and I think, you know, you'll get someone elected soon. It's like, it's, she's not being objective. She's really, she's really sort of, you know, sort of encouraging them, which is sort of like, it's, it's one thing to sort of, you know, cover the rally because it's a, an area of public interest, but it's another thing to sort of, uh, I, I think, you know, appear to advocate for them. Yeah, uh, well, I think that giving these people oxygen is quite terrible. Uh, it, it's like uh, when you've got a, a fire in your oven. You don't keep the oven door open and let it consume your kitchen and then your entire house. You've got to close it straight away. So I, I'm with Ezra here, Faith Goldie, beautiful, intelligent, great reporter, but she's certainly in the wrong here. I'm sorry to say she shouldn't have gone on a neo-Nazi uh, podcast. It's wrong. Um, and she had to be let go. Unfortunately, and terrible because she was such a talent, such a tenacious individual. Uh, her coverage of the uh, illegal migrants crossing into Canada is just amazing. So it's sad to see her go. Yeah. Uh, uh, but unlike Kaylin, she you know left the rebel you know gracefully you know had polite you know parting words. So uh, it's clear that you know she's you know a professional and you know she'll bounce back from this. I, I think that you could put Faith Goldie in the same basket as uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. I think that she's such a talent, uh, so professional uh, in, in most means, bar that. That's probably just a, you know, it's an unfortunate spec on her career. But I think that she'll come back from this uh, mighty high and mighty strong. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing how Faith goes in the future.
Uh, and for all those people who are wanting, wanting to stick the knife into the rebel, like, I don't, I don't think you'll, you'll, you'll get the, the glee that you're after. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you, Jacob, for, for coming on again. Pleasure, Sam. Great chat. Look forward to speaking soon. Yeah, oh, uh, de you're definitely welcome uh, back on any time. Good to hear. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. So please, if you haven't already, sign up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Please consider supporting the work on The Unshackled. You can become a patron on Patreon. We've arranged some awesome benefits for people who sign up to support us. Uh, you can also get Unshackled merchandise at uprightmarket.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking the Unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.